Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody back. We are in Birmingham, Alabama today at ADRS Lakeshore, and we are gonna be talking about vocational evaluation and assistive technology. And at this point, I'd like to hand it back over and allow my guests to introduce themselves. I'm Fran Hershey, and I'm the Program Coordinator and Supervisor of Vocational Evaluation Services. Uh, my name is Michael Washington. I'm the Unit Supervisor for ADRS Lakeshore. My name is Pat O'Brien. I'm the Assistive Technology Specialist. And what exactly is vocational evaluation? Um, it is a service that we offer to our um, consumers, and it is a process that we um, offer that allows individuals to learn about themselves through a variety of testing and conversation and observations um, in an effort to assist with planning either um, post-secondarily um, or just as an adult. And I imagine that's kind of the, um, the first process. A lot of uh, what we talk about is employment. Mm -hmm. um, and so if somebody wants to um, be employed and doesn't really know where to start, mm -hmm. I imagine that vocational eval would, would really help yes. them get a leg up there. Yes, that's, that's absolutely um, correct. Uh, our consumers that come from vocational rehab services, um, the, uh, the initial or the goal is employment. So it's an effort to assist them in the planning process to figure out what are their strengths, what are their challenges, and empower them with information about themselves so that they understand what their preferences are, what their personality styles are, what their skills and abilities are, um, and what their functional limitations are, and what compensations can they um, employ to allow them to be employable I think in, that, in the field of choice. It's a really big thing is self-awareness mm -hmm. there, um, but also um, you know, kind of figuring out what you're interested in, uh, right. even at a young age. And you said there are some things that can kind of help there. Mm -hmm. and I'll kind of jump into what is assistive technology? Well, in, you know, in general, it's just any device or any um, piece of equipment or any system that, you know, we use to help individuals with disabilities, you know, overcome whatever challenges and barriers they have to work or to school. And I imagine there's a ton out there. Uh, of technology. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so if you thought about it, it's there's probably several choices to make from. Um, yeah, it's 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 amazing. You know, considering 25 years ago, you know what wasn't there, and now it's you know just off the shelf, free. Yeah. One of the cool things I think is you see these major corporations doing a lot of innovation in that sector where it's assistive technology, and then once they've refined it and. Um, you know, made it so that it's very workable and helping the individual. They incorporate it into their larger company and they end up seeing that it, uh, it benefits mm -hmm. a lot, a lot of people, mm -hmm. pretty much everybody. Um, and I think that's kind of a, uh, I don't know, it's not a euphemism, but an analogy of, you know, uh, individuals with a disability being employed at any company. Mm -hmm. Um, is it's not just individuals getting that, that benefit of working, but it's the whole company sure. uh, getting that benefit. Yes. So well, you know, I, if, if I can add to that, um, because I think you guys are hitting on to something, um, where you talk about where, we're, where we come from mm -hmm. and where we are now. Um, you know, there, there was a starting point even with our evaluation process and even with our assistive technology program. Um, our evaluation program uh, we started back in the 70s and we only had one evaluator that was covering everyone that came into our program. Um, we had individuals that would come from across the state to one facility um, and we had and we would serve them. Eventually in the 1980s we started, we had a second evaluator that came on board um, and we primarily served individuals that had spinal cord injuries and issues with physical disabilities. It wasn't until the 90s when we started, what we primarily do is a lot of learning disability type testing and evaluations. Um, it wasn't until the 90s after we got the LD grant um, in order to start providing those services. Um, the LD grant was only supposed to be funded for three years, but the Alabama Department of Rehab saw how much they were getting from the services that were being provided from vocational evaluation that they picked up funding for it and continued it on. And one of the things that's beautiful about assistive technology and vocational evaluation is almost like a marriage. Mm -hmm. um, before it was assistive technology, it was called um, the work adjustment, not work adjustment, I'm sorry, business education program. Mm -hmm. 
And this was back in the 70s, and we were helping individuals that were in wheelchairs learn how to use computer programs. And eventually, uh, they went to, that was kind of a nine-month program that you had to go through that was based off of an IBM curriculum. Mm -hmm. And we turned it into what it is today, which is more of a one-on-one -on -one type of thing. So that just kind of shows that evolution that we talked about, how you start off as one thing and then you just start growing and developing based on your needs and what's going on with, with, the, with the world, mm -hmm. where yeah. we are. And I think it's unique that we can incorporate assistive technology into our vocational evaluation. Um, for example, if an individual is unable to um, mark in a traditional manner with a paper and pencil, I might call Pat in to come and uh, modify the, the manner in which they um, provide answers. It might be that it's on the computer of some type. Um, so that's been really um, a nice thing that we have access to here at Lakeshore and really sets us apart is that access that's readily available right you know right in real time and he also can do that aside of an evaluation once we identify the need for it um, we try not to introduce too much technology into the evaluation we want to um, don't want to have that anxiety of trying something new but in a lot of yeah, cases it's really keep, helpful if we have to introduce something new if the, if the person's not using any at yet i um, will try to keep it really simple um, like if they can move their finger to control the touchpad, we might introduce, you know, a wireless touchpad so they can respond to the test questions on computer and then that, you know, where they can control page turning of the test booklet and, you know, using an on-screen keyboard to mark their answer rather than having to scribe everything. So mm -hmm. I try to help them become as independent as they can during the actual testing part, um, but yeah, not overcomplicated. I mean, we don't want to introduce something that's got a huge learning curve while you're taking yeah, the test. Taking yeah. It's like you got to learn two yeah. things at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. But we've come up with some pretty neat, innovative ways to, you know, accomplish basic reading comprehension, spelling and writing, and those kind of tests for folks who, you know, 10 or 15 years ago wouldn't have been able to independently, you know, do the test themselves. Yeah. Okay. And he almost always is involved with our home-based assessment where we go into the home and we do a vocational evaluation uh, simply because the individual uh, is not able to get out of their home um, for various reasons. It is our preference that we bring them into our testing environment, but there are just sometimes uh, it's just not a feasible option for that individual. Um, yeah, those are really interesting cases. Um, one of them, we had a fellow that needed a voc voc eval, but he was uh, he basically couldn't move. Um, he was on a, you know, a vent, a feeding tube. They just really couldn't even get him out of the house. But the guy could use like one digit on each thumb. So when we got there, he had already figured out and with him and his family, he used two different um, trackballs and he had this gigantic computer screen hovering over his hospital bed in his room. So he really, you know, he had a method of responding and we just had to go in with the evaluator and figure out you know, how are we going to, you know, what's going to be the best format to get the test in an electronic format. And um, that was a really neat, because he did, you know, he did a great job in his evaluation and, you know, going to college and it was. Uh, yeah. I'd like to talk about that a little bit. I feel like uh, some individuals may seem down, like there is no hope that they can go to college or, or get a, um, a job if they have some of those limitations that you were just describing, bedridden. And, uh, and stuff like that. So talk a little bit about that experience that you had with that uh, client, if you would. You know, family support is the key in all of those that, you know, really still have the spirit and the drive and, you know, and the want to. It, it I mean, for me, it's always been, if there's strong family support, they just help them get the things in place. Um, if, there's, if there's limited or no family support, you know, those are the ones that really don't end up, you know, I'll meet them 15 years later and they're still, you know, unfortunately not doing much of anything, but I mean, that's usually the key. I mean, you know, the, the technology's there, the resources to get the technology and stuff are usually there. You know, the services to evaluate them and recommend, you know, a good plan is usually there, but it's that family support is that, is, um, that is key. And I think um, online, you know, college is really open to many opportunities for individuals mm -hmm. and it is a more feasible option. Um, and I think that there are a lot of home-based employment options, 
you know, we've tapped into a few um, and can recommend we, could, we do our um, evaluation and then we brainstorm together and try to give the vocational rehab counselor some direction of some options that they might want to consider for this individual. And it's, um, we, we have seen individuals that really didn't feel that they were going to have that opportunity, um, but once we started laying out a possible plan and sharing their strengths, it really was opening their eyes to uh, what they could actually um, achieve themselves. And one of the things I wanted to add to that, um, going back to what Pat said about the family, sometimes, the, in, and there are situations where the family they're not available or they don't have that family support. You know, we try to do the best that we can to be realistic with the results and realistic with our recommendations, but at the same time, we try to empower. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and what I mean by that, with some of the recommendations we make, we try to make recommendations to help people where they may be limited in areas to give them guidance on, you know, here's where you're strong at, or here, here are ways to kind of help to develop in those areas of weakness. Because, as I said before, sometimes they don't yeah, have that spite, family support. In spite of if they have no, no or little family support, right. yeah, we do try to help them, you know, figure out how to get it done themselves. Yeah, because sometimes it, it depends on them. I mean, they have to depend on themselves to make that that initial step. Yeah. And, and I think that uh, Lakeshore is a, a holistic approach. You know, we don't just look at a test score and empower that way. We really look beyond the test score. We look at we do look at the family support and we look at what resources are out there and try to identify those. Um, we look at labor information and help them to see, you know, that that is available in the community or if it's not in their community, it's available um, online for them to be able to access that type of employment. So I think that holistic approach really um, has some, been something that's really set Lakeshore apart. Mm -hmm. It sounds almost like you guys are kind of life coaches in a way, because especially <laughs> at the age group where you're thinking about going to college or maybe getting your first job, there, there's a lot of stuff and uncertainty at that age. You're graduating out of the traditional education system. And, you know, even at any point in life where you're kind of going to the next step, it is very nice to have that reassurance from somebody else kind of coaching you or walking you through that. And uh, I know that there are the... Um, uh, the VR counselors, but you guys are kind of the first one there uh, with them to, to say, hey, this is what you're, we see that you're really good at. Let's kind of focus in on this. And, and I think the rehab counselor really um, looks to us to gather that information and to share it back and to help them get to know that person. We do have the luxury of, you mm -hmm. know, spending, we do an, mm -hmm. a thorough intake interview. We spend, you know, one to three, four days with an individual in the evaluation. And then we do a feedback session where it's a continuation of the evaluation. And we still are talking about, you know, what what is needed. Uh, it may not be included in that report because the dialogue continues as the feedback occurs. Mm -hmm. um, we also look at plan A, we look at plan B, and we look at plan C. If a person is very undecided, um, you know, plan A might be, yeah, if you want to go to college, this is um, an option. You could go straight to work. Um, and maybe the third option would be that you work for a little bit and then later you go to college. And you know, and to, to not to contradict you, but to kind of contradict you a little bit with the life coaching, um, I really feel like it's more of a we understand the population that we're trying to serve. Mm -hmm. um, and we also, we're willing to listen. You know, yeah. if we don't quite understand who you are or what your needs are, we're willing to listen. And we're willing to, to let's assess and see where, what your needs are and let's try to help. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what we're willing to do. And our evaluation is like a puzzle. I mean, each piece of information that we have, starting with the referral and the questions that the rehab counselor sends over, um, to the information that they provide us, the case records, to the intake interview, the test results, the conversation, the observation. And when we get to the feedback and we create a report, we hope that that provides a complete jigsaw puzzle of who that person is. And sometimes there's a piece or two missing and it might be during that feedback that those pieces, you know, come to light and we can snap them in. Or if they don't, then we can say, this is additional information we need to seek out. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Well, just the other component too, when we have the neuropsychologist consult, who is kind of right there after testing before feedback. And mm -hmm. I know that yes. makes such y'all apart for- yes. So if you guys need additional 
um, professionals to come in during that process, those are available as well. You said neuropsychologists mm -hmm. there. Is that an ADRS uh, personnel? Well, we um, have a consultant that comes in to our diagnostic staffing, and he um, will review the test results and all the case records. And there are certain diagnoses that he can make or he can update. Typically, they're learning disabilities. They are um, intellectual disabilities. Sometimes we can look at an ADHD update, um, but that oftentimes will require an additional clinical interview with the neuropsychologist. Mm -hmm. gotcha. um, so that that really is a big um, thing that sets yeah, us apart. Yeah, and just show further collaboration that he reaches out. You know, sometimes they'll invite me to come in to give ideas during that staffing, but they almost always have somebody from the employer. Yes. That yes. sits in to give ideas to, you know, when they're knocking around, you know, which way should we go, plan A, B, or C. So that's. Yes. Now, many of the people that are kind of having questions about this uh, will be coming out of the education system. And when you guys talk about uh, the type of supports that are available during this process, uh, would it be similar to an IEP team in a, in a structural kind of thing, like they're coming around you to support you in that process there? That's what I think of when you, when you guys are talking Well, about we that. do, uh, a majority of the evaluations that we do, especially during the school year, are um, transition age students. So we cover the entire state and we um, will go in 11th to 12th grade will be, typically we sometimes see them in the 10th grade, um, but 11th to 12th, and the IEP or the case manager, the IEP teacher, will sit in on the feedback. So we're, we are part of the process, mm -hmm. um, but once we finish an evaluation at Lakeshore, we close the door on that person as far as that service is closed and the VR counselor is going to continue to be the case manager and may refer back to mm -hmm. Lakeshore for additional services or to another community rehab program. Um, it just depends on what the needs are of the individual. How long does that process typically take from when you're meeting with the IEP and the individual, or I mean the case manager and the individual, to when you guys kind of close that case? Um, so when we get a referral, we uh, we have a, a process that we go through to get them scheduled. Um, for example, if we're going to see students at this particular high school, we will wait till the referrals come in to form a group if they are. Um, and a group of individuals that could function in a group. Mm -hmm. And then we set up the evaluation. The evaluator and the aide will go out and work with roughly seven individuals. Um, so that will be a period of a week. Then when they get back to the office, they're still processing prior cases, but they will start the process uh, processing of those cases. And we will um, do the diagnostic staffing and schedule the feedback. So I would say the process from entrance into our program to exiting is going to be our target is six weeks. Six weeks. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's a very um, good and concrete thing for people to hear. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're like, and they can always go back into the right. evaluation process, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, if mm -hmm. they, mm -hmm. you, know, yes. you, you see that quite often. Yes. 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 A revolving door. Yes. And, and here's here's one of the things that I like to kind of stress. Um, it's also important when we reach out uh, to set up intake interviews or reach out to set up the appointments um, that we hear back from the consumer or we hear back from the family um, because that can delay the process. If we've you know tried to contact you and and we get it. Sometimes you get you get so many random phone calls that you're not sure what's a valid number and what's not. Uh, but if we leave a message and we're trying to set up an individual for testing, call us back. Call us back as soon as possible um, to make sure we can get you in as timely as possible. And, and sometimes it's it's not a good time in a person's life. And just to say, you know, I'm just not interested right now, mm -hmm. maybe later. Mm -hmm. um, it's okay to say no. Um, we, we, we value the evaluation and we feel like it's helpful, but we know that there are times where mm -hmm. it's just not something that right. is, is good for them at that time. Um, but I, I do um, mm -hmm. strongly um, <laughs> agree with what Michael's saying as far as just responding back to our efforts. Yeah. Um, I'd like, I, I hear the word evaluation quite a bit here, and um, when, I, when I think of you know, the seven people or the group getting together and, and coming out and being evaluated. I always feel, I kind of feel like it's an SAT type of thing. And I get a little bit nervous about right. that. You know, people, yes. I got nervous. I still get nervous about taking tests mm -hmm. or evaluations. Yeah. So I'd like to ask a little bit about what that process of the evaluation looks like 
after I ask the question from a viewer. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and they have a question on assistive technology. Okay. <laughs> and so Allison Haynes, who um, of, of People First, has been with us on a couple different broadcasts. But she asked if you could describe some of the assistive technology that you can help people with disabilities either for college or on the job. I know that I have the Dragon program, mm -hmm. um, left-handed scissors and an electric stapler that I was to use at my first job with people first. So I guess she's wondering, wanting to know um, what are you most excited about that you well, see? Probably the most popular that I see uh, two pieces of assistive technology for students in college and, and they work for folks at work too. Um, for folks that struggle with note taking or paying attention or even new learning, but especially note taking. Um, Audio Note Taker is an awesome piece of software um, that is just really changing the way uh, all students really could, could benefit from using it. And then the other really popular uh, technology is the Smart Pen. And there's you know at least three versions of the Smart Pen depending on you know what works best for you. But those are both. Um, very popular right now and you know I would say affordable um, audio note taker is about $350 for a perpetual license the smart pens a couple hundred dollars when you buy the accessories and stuff with it so those are two those are probably the two that I you know assess folks for that are heading to school or they're having trouble on the job yeah. taking notes in meetings or um, that kind of thing so the audio note taker would that be like I would install it on my phone or well it you know ideally you would use it the full program on your laptop so you would have your laptop in class or in the meeting at work but if you you know don't have it available there's an app that's made by the same company that um, that you can use most of the features on but it's really just kind of designed just to do the recording part yeah um, now does it transcribe for you um it doesn't it doesn't do from uh, speech to text speech uh, to text yeah yeah, yeah. But it's a great tool. I would encourage folks that are struggling with note taking to go explore it. You can use it for 30 days free of charge. Um, yeah. I wish all these meetings and all these lectures, they would just record. Yeah. <laughs> they well, should if you have audio note taking. Uh, yeah. yeah. And then, yeah. Uh, you know, we don't see this as much, but for some of the more like uh, technical training programs, I, I had a fellow once who was in an HVAC program, and, um, you know, we asked about, he had, audio recording approved but we talked to the instructor about um, since it was a lot of hands-on about him using a GoPro and just like literally video recording the whole you know each one of their classes and so you know even simple off-the-shelf stuff like that, that you don't think about as AT yeah you know it worked out great for that guy you know just kind of eliminated note-taking altogether and yeah get a little stand for your yeah, phone or something yeah um, so tell me about the uh, smart pen yeah, so the smart pen, um, basically, if you turn on the record feature on it, it's gonna, whatever you're, whatever you're writing at that moment, whatever's being said in the room, is gonna be linked to, the, to whatever you write on the paper. And so it just, um, it's got a camera in the, in the end of the, the pen, uh, depending on which version of the pen you use, uh, one of the pens has the recorder built in, the other pen, you, you have to have your iPhone there, your, iPad to do the recording part but yeah it literally when you put it in record mode so it's great for graphical note taking like in a math class or a science class mm -hmm. more than a, than a class where it's a lot of linear note taking so it's good for you know if you're having to draw out you're watching the teacher break down the equation and you know you're trying to just copy everything down and you're not really listening to the explanation. That's exactly what I'm thinking you, about you have, class. Yeah, you <laughs> capture the explanation. Yeah. So you can still just, you know, write down uh, the actual problem and not worry about the fact that you don't have to really listen to the professor. Um, so it's a it's a really neat Now you said they're linked up. The audio and your notes are linked up. Yes. So does as soon as you write it down, does that yes. audio and video transfer to like an so you online can, file? So you can, uh, again, depending on which pen you have, um, uh, you can either just tap anywhere in your notebook on the notes, on the paper notebook, and it'll start playing it back through the pen, what was said right then, or you can transfer, transfer that recording, and it takes the image of your handwriting and the audio, and they have a piece of software that runs on a Mac or a PC, and then you see everything on screen. Um, you can search through I your notebooks. <laughs> yeah, it's a very <laughs> smart I'm thinking, pen. like, even if you didn't have a notebook, could you just write on the table? Uh, no. 
-hmm. No, you have to you have to have special uh, notebooks. That okay, you buy okay. From the company, yeah. So you are locked into to buying their uh, their notebooks. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's. I was like, there's no way you could just like not write, but just no, like no. signal your hand and well, it still be like linked up. And <laughs> but you know, for folks who really struggle to take notes because they just can't take what the teacher's saying and put it in their own words, and they have spelling issues and writing issues and or dysgraphia or whatever, and they just they just can't do that. With a smart pen, at least they could just they could just write important or just IMP or just a little note. They really don't have to take any notes. Yeah. But just when the topic changes, just topic two and just put it down. So that's you know it's you don't have to do a lot of writing with it really. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of designed just to. Um, I wonder if they share it. those notes with other uh, students. You can. Um, I don't run across that a lot, but yeah, you can you can share all the. Um, what they call them, pen cast is what they call them. Yeah. I imagine you become very popular in that you class. Become very popular. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, yes, you could. And audio note taker uh, projects is what they call those. You can share those as well. That's really you know, cool. Everything's shareable these days. Yeah. yeah. And I think there's so much that could be implemented in the high school setting where individuals could start practice using these things. Mm -hmm. um, because I think what that does is builds their confidence to realize that, you know, I could be a competitive. Um, college student, you know, I maybe I can't take notes, but with some assistive technology, um, the world is uh, more open. Mm -hmm. yeah. Come back to Allison, I guess her question about what in the, in the you know, in the world of work. Um, besides those two things, probably what I deal with, uh, that you know, we don't think of as AT maybe, but um, workstation modification. So, you know, all the new cool electric sit stand tables and ergonomic chairs and um, you know specialized um, mouse devices and things that help um, our older population that have <laughs> neck problems and shoulder problems and lower back issues that's a big thing yeah. that they're saying nowadays is yeah. from us sitting kind of by behind computers yep. quite a bit yes. we had a chance to um, uh, have a young boozer who was a previous uh, treasurer in the state of alabama um, and we went down to his office down in uh, Montgomery and he had this really sweet standing mm -hmm. table and he was saying, you know, the studies that we're seeing is, um, you know, if you sit down for extended periods of time, it's almost as bad as, you know, uh, nicotine smoking or something like that. And, um, so it's very yes. important to get up or, um, you know, and I've seen um, some some wheelchairs recently at conferences that are standing wheelchairs yeah. like yeah. those are super cool yeah. and you still have all the full control of mobility there uh, in a standing position so yeah that's that's really cool and the, the adults i've worked with you know after the fact that get the sit stand um, they always come back and go i think better when i'm standing you know wish i had started standing you know so it's not just their back that it helps it's like they just think better standing up um, yeah. you know wireless headset again it seems like it's just off-the-shelf technology but uh, can be so helpful if you're having to talk on the phone and use your computer at the same time I wonder where it's going to be in another, another 20 30 years <laughs> it'll be like a fully Crazy immersive three and everything will be recorded <laughs> audio and video yeah. you'll yeah. be able to grab that equation off the board and, like yeah. pull the x down yeah well so, there's some, that's what, yeah, yeah. That's some what pretty neat stuff already uh, i mean we look back at how far things have come just in our lifetime uh, as, as an yeah. employee it's it's crazy I mean we didn't even have access to computers yeah. we were dictating or handwriting our reports yeah and having them typed yeah. well you guys are talking about the first kind of computer program here was an IBM based thing yes. and I'm going I wonder what that looks like, <laughs> yeah, it's like Very a little archaic. neon <laughs> character yeah. showing up on yeah. the street. Yeah. So they were using, they had dumb terminals in Lakeshore in the, in the building and they were tied up to the mainframe at the Lakeshore Hospital on that same campus. So yeah, they were they were learning to code basically. Yeah. Yeah, it was pretty boring. Going some you know, C, <laughs> yeah. whatever, <laughs> I don't know much programming. And Michael, as soon as the junior colleges and other, other colleges, as soon as, you know, they became accessible physically, it was curb cut downs and all the you know power doors and and all that kind of thing uh, yeah that there was that need for that just kind of went away yeah. but you know personal computers were coming in the need for uh, learning to you know find a, assistive technology for for pcs you know became kind of the focus so. i feel like it sometimes leads the industry yeah. like like these big corporations yes. will find a main product but then when they start to 
reiterate off their, their first few shells there, they kind of focus, or they sh I think they should be focusing on people with a disability that need extra features or benefits out of these main products. Yeah. And then the next thing you know, it's exploding into yes. you know regular uh, society. Yeah. And, and people are saying, I could definitely, I'm thinking back, I could. I would love to have used that stuff in math class. Yes. You, you yes. know, I studied physics in college and there are many times where I'm going, professor, uh, yeah. Please Shut stop. Down. Let down. me tell you, I'm 15 yes. minutes behind yeah. you. I'm still on the left side of the board. Yes. You know, so it's, uh... And I'm like you, I've read, I mean, I can't remember exactly what product it was, but there were several products like in the gaming industry that were created based off of accessibility needs. And it's mainstream now. It's something that we all use. And right. if it wasn't for somebody having a need uh, right. assistive tech, no, tech wise, it wouldn't have been a mainstream. You know, voice input was kind of like that, you know, in the late 80s and early 90s. It was really being designed for folks who couldn't control a keyboard and a mouse. And uh, it was very primitive and very, very expensive. And I think about where it's come now, that what you have on your phone just blows that stuff out of the water. And it was like, you know, a computer and, a, and the software, and, you know, in the early 90s to, to run those early Dragon programs, you know, you'd spend $6,000 and they didn't yeah. understand after what you said. And, uh, but yeah, mm -hmm. that that really, you know, as that became just part of normal business, you know, a way to input data, the prices just mm -hmm. came down dramatically, and the, and, the, and the you know the speech engines just exploded with you know capability. So yeah, speech is a big thing. I heard somebody, uh, I forget who it was, I saw a quote that said, "We've got more technology in our smartphones now mm -hmm. than uh, the technology when we put somebody on the moon." Or like wow. the whole operation, yeah, yeah. Wow. You know, yeah. it's ridiculous. Or maybe it was yeah. the RAM or the operating yeah. power yeah. or something. But um, I think that's really cool because not only is it the technology that we're using, um, but also it allows the jobs to be more home-based, like you said. Um, so it allows more freedom and it opens up the job opportunity. Uh, to more people that I think wouldn't necessarily have that, where you had to go into work every day and you had to physically be there at a desk and do it how the company won. These these major corporations that are having this new tech, they're they're opening up a lot of a lot yeah. of places. Mm -hmm. And I see you guys is really introducing that to the community and helping them get on uh, to that to that bandwagon uh, yeah. in a way. There. Um, before we get into the emails, I have one more question. <laughs> the uh, out of the clients that you serve. Do you think more of them are looking to get into college or more into employment during the first phase? And they might be a couple. Of I would say that the majority of the individuals we see in high school, their next step is that they want to go to college. Now, sometimes college is not the most appropriate option for them. And it's at that point that we'll say, well, yeah, you can choose to go to college and these are the resources that may help you to be more successful, but here are some other options. Uh, but the majority of them, that is their their hope and their dream is to move forward with college. But you know, we have to look at the financial end of it. We need to look at, you know, the um, major that they're looking at uh, and really help them um, make the best decision for themselves. Uh, we see a lot of our students or our adults who have never been to college and now maybe because of, a, of an injury, they wanna now pursue something that uh, involves college so we might look at it from that perspective yeah. of returning as an adult mm -hmm. and we you know we see a lot of our individuals go back and pursue either an alternative degree or their first degree and, and a lot of times with the evaluation that's where we run into those those realistic um, suggestions mm -hmm. because you know you may have a student that's talking to friends and you know that everyone has these wild expectations about things and I always say and I know friend always says that a test is just and it's a it's a tool it's not you know it doesn't necessarily it can give you guidance on a person's ability but what really can tell you the person's ability is you know how much effort they're willing to put into anything yes. so you know the tool can say one thing but if someone is willing to put that extra effort then they can do I mean there's there's the sky's the limit but there are times that you also want to guide people to be realistic about what their abilities are because you don't want to set somebody up for failure. You know, somebody can have all the drive in the world and it's just it's just not in the stars. And you want to be careful about guiding them the right way because um, 
sometimes people can set themselves so high that they set themselves up for failure and it's hard to bounce back from that failure. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's, that's sometimes when we yes. have to have those hard conversations. Yeah, um. <laughs> yeah if, they, if they're interested in the medical field, there's many, many, many different things you can do in the medical field. Um, so we talk about that, you know, what is the, what, why are you interested in the medical field? What about it, the medical field that's appealing to you? Um, you know, where did this interest stem from? Well, you know, my mother is a nurse or, um, when I was younger and I had a lot of uh, medical problems, I had this great nurse. So we try to look at that and then create some ideas that they might be capable of pursuing. Yeah, kind of reinforcing that um, you uh, received a lot of benefit from some caring yes. and giving. Maybe you want to care and give yes. back, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that specific right. thing. That's right. right. And I even stress with uh, individuals that, you know, when you go to a bit place of business, the receptionist is your first line of person that you're gonna see. And for example, here at Lakeshore, you come in, you talked about being nervous about testing. It's that receptionist that can make a difference in that person's life as they enter into an unfamiliar environment. Mm -hmm. So you really have an opportunity to be a helper. Yeah. It's just you're not caregiving. Mm -hmm. you're, you're expressing compassion and doing things like that. So I think it's real important to get at what, why is it that they want to do what they want to do. Yeah, and speaking of receptionists, a lot of times they're the face of the company, the yes. first thing you see. Yes. Uh, and that's what people remember. Yes. You know, I got there and was greeted warmly and mm -hmm. you know, yes. from there. So the evals, we were kind of talking about it there, kind of digging in um, of why you want to do these things. Um, so it's not like you're sitting down and taking a test. It's not like you're doing an SAT. But if there are seven people uh, at a high school that you're going to visit, what would that what would that exactly look okay, like? Okay, so typically on the first day, we spend some time introducing ourselves and we go through our orientation. We talk about why why we're doing what we're doing. And then we do start with what we call the more group-based testing. We try to get that out of the way on the first day. And it's gonna be similar to, but not exactly like SAT testing. They're gonna be short in duration. There's gonna be varied activities. And we, uh, you know, maybe three minutes, five minutes. And then the next, or the, the few days after that, we start doing more one-to-one, -one, mm -hmm. where we'll pull people out and work with them individually while the group sitting in the room, perhaps doing some um, paperwork, you know, filling out questionnaires, doing interest inventories. And then uh, if, if they're done with that, we can send them back to class and pull the students from the classroom. So the evaluation, may, we may say it's five days, but we like to have the five days to be able to pull them as we need them during that period of time. Now, we also do one-on-one -on -one testing. So it, say an individual will not function well in a group. Maybe their anxiety is very high and a group environment is not appropriate. Or they are not able to use their um, hands to mark the answer. So we would pull them out and do one-on-one. -on -one. Or if they have a, a significant intellectual disability, they might be one-on-one. -on -one. So we, we do it in different ways. We try to look at what the individual is capable of doing with respect to independent functioning and then we will group them either in a group there might be a small group it might be a larger group or we might do it one-to-one -one. and then you said it takes about uh, six weeks be typically for the whole week process and then at the end of the six weeks do you give uh, like them the full evaluation yes. back to the mail and no we we bring them in um, we set up a feedback session and it's typically the evaluator the consumer, the vocational rehab counselor, and then if the school has been involved and we have the feedback at the school, a lot of times the parents can invite the case manager or the IEP teacher to that meeting. And we talk about the results. We, we, we're very um, upfront. We talk about cognitive abilities. We talk about achievement. Um, and we, we try to empower them with as much information as we can. We discuss our um, our results, uh, our recommendations for them. We talk about things they might consider in the planning process once the vocational rehab counselor gets back to them with the planning phase of their program. Mm -hmm. It's kind of more, it's like a dialogue and a brainstorming yes. session. It sounds kind of formal, but it's really not. It's, yes. it's, it's 
a lot more give and take than yes. Um, it's a lot more involved in the tests that I took in ninth grade. Yes. <laughs> and that, grade the other thing, realized, yes. I did a multiple choice test. And that was it. Yes. And I met with my counselor for, I think, 15 minutes. And she was like, I forget what they say. You're going to be in a band or something. <laughs> <laughs> I've never played an instrument in my life. <laughs> um, and I, too, went through that. You know, um, one of the things they recommended was an airline stewardess, and I just laugh about that all the time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so um, I, the other thing that we do is we hand them the report. We say, here it is. And as a professional, that really makes you accountable because uh, I've had other positions in evaluation where I left it to the VR counselor to, res to discuss the results with the consumer. And I wasn't as accountable to what I put in there. Mm -hmm. And um, I, that's been a really big thing that I feel very strongly about. Um, we give them multiple copies so that they have one to keep in their file, and then they have others to share with disability support services, with another professional that they um, may come in contact with. And we never know who's going to put their hands on our report. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it's an attorney, sometimes it's a disability support service, sometimes it's a psychologist. So we don't know. So we have to really write it to meet the needs of all of those audiences but still make sure that that individual understands themselves through the report. Yeah, I feel like that could get full of jargon pretty quick. Yes. Uh, technical jargon, medical jargon, and yes. the individual's like, so what am I supposed to do? We, we try very hard to be um, to, to write it in um, layman's terms, um, but get the points across. And we do include the scores in the report so that if it does go to another professional, they can make sense of those scores they have those at, at, at a higher sure. level. Yes. Yeah. yes. You know, and, and to add to that, because you, you said a great word of accountability, but on top of that, it goes back to what we were talking about as far as the holistic approach. Yes. Um, you know, we spend time, and I feel like each one of our evaluators, they go in, they try to create a relationship with the individuals that they're working with, and then they ask questions even during the evaluation process they may ask individual questions because they need to get a better understanding of this person that they're working with and then at the end is closure you know i see the feedback session is closure so we don't want to just you know spend all this time on the front end getting this information picking their brain and them people disclosing things to us that we, we hope will be helpful in the process of creating a good report to just all of a sudden just say, okay, here's the information. We want to give them closure. And that's part of that feedback session, which is why another reason mm -hmm. why it's so important to us outside of, because I totally agree, yes. um, I, outside of that, that's the other reason. And I think it's very, um, I would say gratifying as an evaluator and for an individual to say at the end, this really is me. Mm -hmm. This, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's a um, it's an affirmation of what we're doing, and that it is a beneficial tool for them to use in their planning process. Mm -hmm. um, and you guys serve the whole state. Yes. So i How many uh, customers or clients do you guys see? You think in a typical year? Um, and it depends. <laughs> so if we're talking specifically evaluation, we can serve anywhere to nine hundred. Uh, 900 to 1,000 people within a particular year. And how many um, staff do you guys have for that 900? Well, for this particular program, we have 22 people that not, this is not including just the evaluators. So we have roughly, I think he says, we said 17, 17. evaluators. Uh, and then we have staff that support those evaluators. Okay. So in all, we've got 22 people that serve in that program. Now we went, and remember I told you earlier, we had one person that was an evaluator back in the 70s, mm -hmm. went up to two in the 80s, yeah. and we're at 22. Mm -hmm. And it's still, I mean, because we still could use even more. Mm -hmm. um, but that's that's with all of our programs. But we do the best we can with what we got. <laughs> We've said, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, we said the, the word holistic before, but it makes 100% sense um, <clears throat> that these types of programs get funded because it comes back not only to help the individual through their life to live a full life, um, but it also goes back to the local community in the state of Alabama, um, whether that's, you know, they're giving back to the companies that are employing people here and paying taxes and, and money here in the state, um, or, you know, just giving back through their work in the state. Um, 
you know, so if I was if I was uh, you know a legislator or something, I would be wanting to pour money into these programs for you know the return in twenty years, you know, the long term return there. Uh, so I think that they're going more that way. Like you said, since the seventies and eighties, it's become a long way, um, and uh, I think it's going to continue to go that way. That'd be right. Yeah, <laughs> no, I feel like there's a lot of push coming now. Yes. Uh, down the line for that. Yeah. And I think the partnership with Transition has really. You know, helped with that because uh, you know all of us with children are planning for transition, um, and especially an individual with a disability, um, trying to figure out what is the next step. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are there any specific um, success stories that come to your mind, like in the first couple seconds? You don't have to say the individual, but just kind of start to finish. Like this person wasn't sure, and then you know, was very confident at the end of that. Um, and try and be as specific as possible. I would say um, one of the experiences that I had, I worked with a local plumbing um, company and there were individuals who couldn't, who were having difficulty passing the, the test to move to the next level. And vocational rehab came in, we did an evaluation, and the result of that was that they, we, we identified the accommodations for the testing and they were able to pass and advance to the next level, mm. and that that was a um, that was something that they had struggled with for years in trying to pass those tests, mm -hmm. and just that you know just an investment of you know a morning um, and able to identify those accommodations, get that disability documented. They they were in the plumbing industry because their performance IQ, their their ability to do hands on and abstract thought mm -hmm. was really good and um, the verbal part was a more of a challenge for them and that that was one of those experiences where you saw a direct result um, and yeah. it was a, a short-term investment with a long-term return and they've been working on it for years mm -hmm. and you know, in a morning yes. uh, they can flip a switch and yes. so the what kind of so it was a verbal assessment uh, uh, that they were? We, the, the test that we did, you know, we just looked at um, academics, our achievement, and cognitive ability and documented the disability. And then we looked at ways they could accommodate it in the testing situation. For example, having someone read the test to them or um, you know, finding a way to tab their book and help them um, navigate because it's an open book test. Well, okay. if you can't read the textbook, that's a whole other problem. Yeah. So we looked at ways to accommodate that so that they could navigate their textbook while they're answering their questions. And extended time was a big part of that as well. Yeah, I have a family member that um, I got extended time in college uh, as well, and that was a big thing for her. Mm -hmm. um, so what is, a, a, if um, you mentioned not being able to read through the textbook or the tabs, what are some things, maybe if someone's in high school right now and is having that, it has an open book test, right. what would you recommend to them there? Um, well, audio books would be number one, just having the textbook in uh, an audio format. Um, sometimes you can have it where it's on your computer where you can see it, but you can touch a button and it will read the text to you. Mm. And so that's really a helpful thing. If, if the textbook were online, um, we just call that books in alternative format. Yeah. You know, it used to be recordings for the blind and dyslexic, and it's just evolved into a much greater thing and a more useful tool. I thought you were going to go control F there, which oh. is control find. <laughs> so if you have an open document yes. online and you see like a keyword in the question, you can go control F and then type it in, and then it'll go right to the part of the textbook. I think that that would be um, fabulous, but it would give them, quote, a leg up. Yeah. Because the the person sitting next to them does not have that control find, you know, control F to find it in the text. So that would not be an accommodation unless everybody that was taking the test because the intent of the accommodation is to put them on equal footing. Mm -hmm. Yes. That makes sense. I feel like you just give it to everybody that will control F. Yes. Yeah, as long as you're getting the right answers there. <laughs> yes. But I understand you need to, you didn't know there. Um, is there another specific um, success example maybe from an assistive technology? Yeah, there's some simple ones and then um, one simple one popped in mind with, with what y'all were talking about, about screen reading software. Um, the consumer was, you know, had severe dyslexia um, and thought they wanted to be a nurse but was just getting overwhelmed with the terminology and just couldn't really deal with it. And just a simple $50 screen reading 
program helped her realize, hey, I can read this stuff. It also made her realize that's not the right um, vocational goal for me. And so she ended up transferring in, to Auburn, which was much harder school than where she was, and ended up, I think she was in marketing or uh, graduated with honors and was kind of a, a showcase, you know, it was just a technology student for them as well. Um, and then the other fellow I mentioned earlier who was in his home, and I forgot, he, he couldn't speak either, so his, he had no intelligible uh, language, uh, spoken language because of his disability. And, you know, he really could only move those two digits and he could move his eyes. And, you know, and just to see him, and I guess we, the, the evaluation helped him and his parents and, his, and other folks around him affirm that he, he really was smart, very smart. And it wasn't just the school, you know, the, the homebound teacher kind of carrying him through and just giving him grades. Um, the testing, I mean, he really knocked the top out of most everything they gave him and ended up, he, he was awarded an academic, you know, uh, scholarship to an online school. Um, wanted to be a, uh, some sort of forensic psychologist or something. And he told us this the first day we walked in and it was really overwhelming to see him and all the stuff and just him physically, the way it looked. Even for us, we had kind of been around for a while, but we still, I'm sure we looked like you know, a little bit surprised. Um, and he told us that uh, he specializes in being able to read people's facial expressions. <laughs> yeah. And me and the bad way looked at each other like, oh, no. That's when you go up there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, were, <laughs> we, were, we were a bit shocked when we walked in, uh, you know, because everything. Uh, and uh, when he told us that, and he, he really, I mean, he could laugh. You could understand his yeah, laugh was really hilarious. But he knew that he, he had just put us right in our spot. So. <laughs> He's, that one comes to mind. That's always special. Um, yeah, it's amazing. He went on to receive that scholarship. Yeah, right? yeah, smart guy. Is it, and how long ago was that? That was probably three years ago, maybe four years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Do you ever have anybody contact you back, or, or do you see like long-term <laughs> success stories? Yeah, yeah. There? And we can go. You know, we can go try to peek back into their VR case and see what's happening. With them. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like I should probably call five teachers I've had throughout my life or just email and be like, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I haven't yet, so I'm sorry, Miss Bye. <laughs> I mean, one of, one of them, <clears throat> one thing that really stuck with me, and it's been a while since I've been in services, but um, I was an evaluator for years, and even during the evaluation, I used to help out with our career prep program, which is more of an employment development service. And I can remember coming into work one day and seeing in my box there was a, um, an invitation card of a student that I worked with um, that had graduated. And the parents sent me the card and was thanking me for just being a part of this individual's life. And that was so satisfying um, and such a heartfelt moment for me um, to have been able I mean, I didn't do it. I didn't feel like I did anything other than be a presence. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's one of the things mm -hmm. that I'm appreciative about when I when I hear the stories from them of successes, is to know that we have the ability to be a presence, and 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 people yeah. people appreciate that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think that's a common thing with all the whole staff, you know, in all the different service areas. Um, when consumers kind of let their guard down, let you know that that's you know it's kind of. We know that y'all are just seeing us as people and, you know, we're just kind of being present to them and, and very accepting. Um, I think a lot of times we're probably the first like professional kind of uh, folks they run into that just, you know, we just kind of just treat them like normal and just yeah. you know, accepting them as they are and trying to help them, you know, wherever they are right then. And, and I, I would say that for our office and our department, mm -hmm. our department is like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you know, um, we do our, when we go all over the state and we go in these remote communities and, you know, we're trying to find places that are a common ground for us to meet. Um, you know, maybe they can't get to the vocational rehab office because it's a hardship to find the transportation to get there, but we say, hey, let's just meet at the public library and we set that up and we go in the room and they're like, you drove all the way from mm -hmm. Birmingham just to mm -hmm. meet with me? And you're like, absolutely, mm -hmm. you know, so that that's really a neat mm -hmm. part of our program is that we really, um, we make a huge effort to 
to get to those individuals who are in the most remote. Um, I've learned about cities in this in this state <laughs> yeah. that I did not even know existed. Yeah. Yeah. All the little back roads. Yes. Like if there's a traffic jam, like nope, we're making yeah. a left yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> I've been here before. <laughs> um, if somebody would like to be, if somebody's in high school or you know even later in life and they'd like like to be evaluated. Um, would they just call ADRS Lakeshore? So every um, high school is assigned a vocational rehab counselor. Okay, now some rehab counselors may be more involved at different schools. Um, so that would be the first step: is to see is who is the evaluate or the VR counselor that's assigned to that school. If they can't find that person, or the, you know, that should not deter them from just calling Montgomery or finding out who the local VR office is mm -hmm. um, and just saying I'd like to apply for services. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes if they, if they call here because they someone gave yes. them our number and they're not a VR consumer yet then our staff just directs and gives them the right office to call to, and they basically just call that folk rehab office and say here's my zip code and they you know can assign them a counselor. Yeah and one of the things that I'd like to I love to reinforce. Um, <laughs> there's no cost associated with our yeah. program. Um, if you are referred from a VR counselor, then there's no cost. Um, and even if we help to get you set up with our, one of our consultant neuropsychologists, um, there's no cost to the individual that's working with us for that service. Do you guys do outpatient? No. Um, <clears throat> do high school teachers, are they sometimes, uh, um, are they the ones that are asking the VR counselors? <clears throat> or are they more individuals asking the VR counselors to come out? Because I imagine as a special uh, education teacher, you would have a very good relationship with the VR counselor. And that would be one of the things that I would do every year is saying, hey, you know, let's do the evals this month, this time, every year. Let's just get it on the calendar. I, th I think it varies by school system. There are some that have very strong working relationships and they are expecting the VR counselor, you know, have they come, have they come? And others maybe don't even, they may not know that that service exists. Mm -hmm. um, but the outreach that we do, we, you know, we market, we do what we can to, to make sure that those services are known. Um, and I think sometimes our parents are not um, educated to know what this means. They sign up for something mm -hmm. and then when we make the phone call mm -hmm. to, to set up the service, they're like, I, what, what, a vocational evaluation? What is that? What, why am I doing this? They, they worry that it's going to um, eliminate the benefits that they're receiving. And really? we tell them, no, mm -hmm. that it's, it, this is something independent of this. This is us looking at your child in terms of employment. And I, I think the safe answer um, along with that is the counselors have a relationship with the schools yeah. and this, the IEP workers, they know yeah. who their VR counselors are that serve in their school and they get the counselors a list of names for students that, you know, Absolutely. look at our potentials for our program. Um, but we are, uh, we are an eligibility program, so anyone that wants to apply for services can apply for services. They don't have to just wait for the school to send a referral over to a VR counselor. Um, but I, I do agree with what Fran was saying about um, sometimes people are afraid. They're afraid to make those referrals because they don't want their students to have, as they say, a, a label. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I, you know, I, and I'm not somebody that attests to that. Yeah, I, I've always felt like it's empowerment. You know, if, if whatever is going on with you to be able to know what it is that's empowering and you know and I would, I would say that to any parent you know don't don't feel like you have to keep your child away from potential services that can help them because you worry about them having a label look at it as empowerment for your child to know i'm i'm this way because there's a reason i'm not just this way because I'm just weird. There's a reason. Mm -hmm. So that's empowering. And it takes strength to ask for help. Yeah. Anybody, you know, I, there have been times in my life, and I think anybody could say that there are times when you need to ask for help, and it's scary to ask for help because mm -hmm. it, you have to admit that you're not as bulletproof as you thought you were right. <laughs> in whatever you're doing. Yeah, but it's a growing thing, and it's a confidence builder. Um, and there are students that are not served under an IEP or a 504 mm -hmm. that might be eligible for our services. Mm -hmm. um, they maybe have elected to not 
share with the school the disability. And so there are those individuals who may not know about vocational rehab because they're not in that program. And so I think it would be important for parents to realize that, that there are services that are available that maybe are not necessarily tied to an IEP or a 504. Mm -hmm. And that's true of adults as well. I mean, we, we talked a lot about transition, but it, it's just as important for adults to understand that these vocational rehab services are available to them. Now, do you guys um, do conferences? Do you guys go uh, to local conferences mm -hmm. and speak about this? Mm -hmm. So I imagine that's where a lot of um, maybe uh, teachers and parents and individuals would go. Uh, so talk about some upcoming events mm -hmm. that you guys will be at or you would, would suggest that uh, some consumers go to, potential right. consumers. So um, in the near future is Transition Conference that's going to be held in Auburn. Um, I and our team is not directly involved with the education part, but there will be a lot of us there. And it gives us an opportunity to sit down and talk with teachers um, and just you know answer questions. Um, we will all have identification that we are with the Department of Rehab Services. Uh, I believe we will have mm -hmm. a booth there, mm -hmm. um, not specifically Lakeshore, but Alabama Department of Rehab Services. So that's just one of the ways that um, we will have presence. And, um, and that is in Auburn. When is that? Um, that's coming up in March. Yeah, I, think yeah, it's, March <coughs> I don't know exactly. Yeah, March, March 2nd, 3rd, second, third and 4th. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's all right. So uh, in a month from today, really. Mm -hmm. So anyone that's listening or will listen to this in the next few weeks, register for that the transition conference in March. Yes, and there's their parents, there's going to be educators there, and it, the whole conference is designed to um, discuss transition issues. We, we annual conferences throughout uh -huh. the year that sometimes yes. maybe not VE or maybe EDS is involved in, you know, the ADHD conferences every year. Yeah, and we just had that one. Autism yes. conference and sport employment conference, so there's, you know, the state through our department is coordinating sometimes our staff mm -hmm. is there presenting yes. but there's lots of those kind of specialized conferences throughout the year yeah, yeah there, no. was an, there was an Alatech conference that was a technology really um, for in, in Auburn in the fall but um, I don't know if that is still mm -hmm. happening or not because I think the, the fellow that was kind of running that is why Auburn? I feel like there's, you just mentioned two big conferences in Auburn. Why not Birmingham and Montgomery? Well, um, Auburn traditionally um, had a, a very strong rehabilitation program, mm -hmm. and a lot of things came from that. They have a very strong special ed um, education program. So I think the draw is, is there, and it just becomes history. Yeah, the Disability Sports Services is, you know, one of the strongest yes. in the country. The the ADHD conference was just in January, and um, I presented with one of the unit supervisors with vocational rehab, um, and we talked about getting services, getting VR services. So that one is usually an annual annual uh, conference, and it's usually held in January. Is that at UA? It was at Tuscaloosa. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was going to say, there's not <laughs> no, much it was uh, University of Alabama <laughs> love it than what I'm hearing for conferences. <laughs> I, I know there's ADAP down there. But, yes, uh, yeah. They, they are. There are conferences all around. <clears throat> well, is there, as we come to the close here, is there anything that we haven't talked about that you think that either an individual or a parent um, would really benefit from hearing about vocational eval or assistive technology? I just wanted to talk about two particular programs that we have at Lakeshore. This, um, this is something we just didn't really touch on, is our deaf, hard of hearing um, evaluations. And we have the opportunity to have access to interpreters that will assist in the process. We have an evaluator who is deaf, who is sign proficient, obviously. And uh, I think it's just a unique program because I think individuals with hearing impairment or with deafness don't um, necessarily think that all those services maybe are available to them. Um, and I know we work a lot with the Alabama School for the Deaf, but we receive referrals, referrals from around the state to work with those individuals. The other program is our Teen Transition Clinic program, and it's a, a program that's bridging the gap between children's rehab services and adult vocational rehab services. And a component of that teen transition clinic process is a vocational evaluation. 
So individuals as early as uh, 15, 15 mm -hmm. you know, can go through, and that's a little bit younger than what we typically would see in our um, other services. Mm -hmm. And we have seen people as 14, but they're usually about to yes. go into 15. Yes. Yeah. Um, CIRIT, and if we're talking about conferences, CIRIT is another one of those conferences. Yes. Um, that's one of the deaf, hard of hearing conferences. Mm -hmm. Um, and it rotates. I mean, it's been out of the state and it's been maybe in Montgomery. I can't remember exactly where it's been, uh, but we have helped out. We have had um, presentations in that CERA conference as well. How do you spell that? Uh, S-E-R-I-D. Now, what it stands for, I can't remember right now. I'll Google that later. <laughs> I think it's Southeast Regional. Maybe Institute for the Deaf, Deaf, maybe, Deaf, or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um. Well, at this point, uh, I would like to thank you guys for being, and, and Lady, for being here today with us. Um, and for everybody else here, we will be going live on Thursday at the Isable Center. And so I look forward to seeing you then. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>